Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omohundro Institute. Welcome to episode 293 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present day world we live in. And I'm your host, Liz Covart. In 1655, Oliver Cromwell, the Lord Protector of England during England's Commonwealth period, launched an assault against the Spanish in the Spanish West Indies. Known as the Western Design, This assault sought to increase England's power in the Americas by challenging Spain's supremacy in the Caribbean. Now, one of England's successes in this challenge was the acquisition of the Spanish colony of Jamaica. Over time, Jamaica would become the crown jewel of Great Britain's Atlantic Empire as its wealthiest and biggest slaveholding colony. How did Jamaica grow to become the crown jewel of the British Atlantic world? Part of the answer is that Jamaica's women became some of the most ardent and best supporters of the island's practice of slavery. Christine Walker, an assistant professor of history at the Yale and U.S. College in Singapore, and the author of the award-winning book, Jamaica Ladies, Female Slaveholders and the Creation of Britain's Atlantic Empire, leads us on an investigation of female slaveholdership in 17th and 18th century Jamaica. Now, during our investigation, Christine reveals how England came to possess and colonize Jamaica why the voices and lives of women and people of color must be uncovered and recovered to understand how the British Atlantic Empire came to be, and information about the lives and deeds of Jamaica's female slaveholders. But first, have you joined the Ben Franklin's World Listener community on Facebook yet? The community is a fun place. It's a place for listeners to chat, ask questions, and to attend special programs. It's also the place where Holly White and I post information about our forthcoming interviews, so that you have a chance to submit questions for our guest historians. The community is free and easy to join. Just visit benfranklinsworld.com slash Facebook. That's benfranklinsworld.com slash Facebook. Okay, are you ready to investigate the history of 17th and early 18th century Jamaica and the different roles that women in slaveholding played in Jamaica's rise to wealth and colonial power? Let's go meet our guest historian. Our guest is an assistant professor of history at the Yale and U.S. College in Singapore. She has expertise in the history of early America and in global and Atlantic history. She's the author of numerous articles and a book, Jamaica Ladies, Female Slaveholders, and the Creation of Britain's Atlantic Empire, which was published by the Omohundro Institute in 2020. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, Christine Walker. Hi, Liz. Thanks so much. It's great to be here. In Jamaica Ladies, Christine investigates the lives and actions of women slaveholders in early 18th century Jamaica. And she does this in an effort to highlight the important role that these women played in fostering Great Britain's colonial Atlantic Empire. Christine, would you tell us about Jamaica and the history behind England's colonization of this island? Yeah, sure, Liz. In a sense, we can think about Jamaican history as almost a microcosm of the history of European colonialism. So the island is originally inhabited by the Arawak people, and they lived there for thousands of years and give the island its name. And people don't usually think of Jamaica in relation to Christopher Columbus, but he actually travels there during his second voyage to the Americas and claims Jamaica as Spanish territory. And several years later, Spanish colonists settle on the island and they bring European microbes with them. And they also attempt to enslave the Arawak people. And pretty quickly, the indigenous population is decimated. Jamaica is then under Spanish rule for about 150 years, but it never really becomes important territory for Spain. And the colonists who settle there are mainly growing provisions, they're raising livestock, and they sell this basically what's food to Spanish galleons that are carrying silver and gold from places that are much more important to Spain, like Mexico and Peru. 
So for Spain, Jamaica is really kind of like a ranching outpost and a refueling station. And when the English are looking for new opportunities in America, Jamaica isn't really on their radar. And this is an era we need to remember when England is not very powerful in the Atlantic world. Spain is the real powerhouse. But when Oliver Cromwell comes into power after the English Civil War, he really wants to challenge Spanish hegemony in the Atlantic. And he devises this secret military plan that he calls the Western Design. And this plan is to seize three islands under Spanish control, Hispaniola, Cuba, and Puerto Rico, but not Jamaica. And he wants to use these islands as a base to launch attacks against the Spanish. So Cromwell sends thousands of troops to the Caribbean to initiate this military strategy, and everything that can go wrong does go wrong. The soldiers are really badly provisioned, they're ill-equipped for the tropical climate, and when they land in Hispaniola, just thousands die of starvation and dehydration and dysentery. And they're pretty quickly repelled by Spanish forces. And this is when they decide to attack Jamaica because it's very poorly defended. So English capture of Jamaica is really an effort to redeem what is viewed as a military fiasco because these generals don't want to return to Cromwell empty-handed. He's not very impressed with the capture of Jamaica and he sends both of the generals to the Tower of London. So this is how England's involvement in Jamaica begins, and things continue to be pretty disastrous for them for the first 15 years or so. It's essentially a military occupation, and they continue to be attacked by Spanish settlers who are still living on the island. So we might think of the colony's beginnings as being very similar to the early decades in Jamestown in Virginia, right? It's really about failure and these soldiers trying to just survive more than a story of success. It's really interesting that you know that the Spanish use Jamaica as kind of a refueling station, because I think when we think of islands serving that purpose, our minds naturally go to islands in the Pacific Ocean or the Canary Islands in the Atlantic. And so now I'm wondering, did the English need Jamaica to serve the same purpose where it's a kind of supply depot and refueling station for other expeditions in the Atlantic? Yes. So in the late 17th and early 18th century, Jamaica becomes much more important than just a refueling station for England. And a lot of this has to do with its geography. It's in really close proximity to other islands that we know England's already tried to capture. So if you're in Jamaica, and you're up in the mountains, you can see Cuba on a clear day. It's also not very far from those important places that I mentioned earlier for Spain, like the coast of Mexico or Panama. And so for England, Jamaica becomes a military base, and it also becomes one of the key depots for the slave trade pretty early on with Britain's involvement in the slave trade with Africa. And the reason is that, again, because of its location, it's very easy to ship enslaved people from Jamaica to these other parts of the Spanish Empire. You know, one of the things I forgot to mention in my last question is that islands like Jamaica were critical as refueling and supply depots and military posts because this was a time, you know, during the 17th and early 18th centuries where Islands tended to belong to one empire. Like if you were sailing around and you wanted to stop at an island, if you were sailing under a different flag from that island, a lot of times you wouldn't actually be able to stop and take advantage of resupplying and refueling. So given that Jamaica had this military function for the English, if you were, say, sailing under the Dutch, French, or Portuguese flag, would you have been able to stop at English Jamaica to? get supplies? I mean, I think there are ships probably from other countries that are stopping in Jamaica on occasion. There's a pretty large contraband trade going out of the colony. I talk a little bit about this with one of the women who I study because she's actually involved in this this contraband trade. 
So there are definitely people who are sneaking into the harbor outside of Kingston that are not English. But when the English first sees the island, they have a pretty hard time kicking the Spanish settlers out because Spain doesn't give them formal possession of the island until 1670. I'm glad you brought up the women you study in your book, because I wonder about the term lady, which you use in your title, Jamaica Ladies. Now, I think when many of us think about lady, our mind produces this image of someone who has an elite, well-refined background, someone who is refined, someone who is well-educated. And I wonder, is this the right image to apply to a woman from Jamaica during the 17th and early 18th centuries? And if it's not the right image, how would English and British Jamaicans have used and applied the term lady? Yeah, Liz, this is a really great question. And I thought a lot about the title and I talked with lots of people about ideas for the title of this book. And I use the word lady because of exactly the reasons that you mentioned. It brings up this very specific idea about womanhood. But in a sense, in the whole book, I'm playing with this term and questioning it from lots of different angles and thinking about what it means to be a lady in Jamaica, where the environment is drastically different from what it is in Britain. So in the early 18th century, the term lady has several meanings. It's a legally an honorific title. It also refers to women who are heads of their households. But it also takes on more informal meanings in Britain, the kinds that you referred to that we might think of, where it implies that somebody is genteel, that she is moderately wealthy. She exhibits good taste through her manners, clothing, and decorum. And a lady is a woman who's seen as somebody who's virtuous and respectable. Now, what really interested me about Jamaica is that respectability comes to mean something very different there. And this difference is bound up with slavery and it's bound up with changing gender roles on the island. The women who consider themselves to be ladies in Jamaica are very diverse. They're economically, ethnically, and religiously diverse. So when I did my research, I found women of European, Euro-African, and African descent. There are also women who are Protestant, Catholic, and Jewish living on the island. Jamaica has a policy of tolerating different faiths. And there are women who are very wealthy and some who are just barely hanging on to middling status. But what these women all share in common is that they're legally free and most of them are enslavers. They are involved in slavery. And this gives the word lady a very different meaning. And the other way that it's different is that sexual virtue or honor just isn't as important for women in Jamaica. So what becomes very important and what defines somebody as a lady is her ability to enslave other people, to assert her legal authority, and also her wealth. Jamaica is a place where women just become a lot richer than they are in other parts of the empire. When I talk about lady, I'm really trying to figure out how people are recoding these kinds of traits that we still think of as being feminine. And the ways that they do this are very different, even from our own perceptions of what lady means today. And this is what makes it very intriguing to me. Now, speaking of women slaveholders, a lot of the older histories of Jamaica have really focused on white male slaveholders and then the actions of those white male slaveholders to bring about the creation of the British Atlantic Empire. So, Christine, would you Tell us a bit about these earlier histories and why they seem to have left out what seems to be a significant population of female slaveholders. And could you tell us what you think we gain when we include these women and families back into the history of Jamaica? Thanks, Liz. This is a big question. And the second part, what does centering the family and women in the history of Jamaica add is really the central question of the book. So to answer the first part, I want to explain, first of all, that there is a very rich and foundational literature on enslaved women in the Caribbean that I'm building on. So it's not that women have been completely left out, but what I noticed when I was reading about Jamaica 
is that everybody described the island as this incredibly masculine space. There was this assumption that female colonists were very marginal to society. They either were unimportant to its development or they're completely under men's control. And because of these assumptions, people weren't really investigating women's roles in slavery. And that's the subject that really interested me. I wanted to understand how Jamaica became the wealthiest colony with the largest population of enslaved people in the British Empire in what was a remarkably short period of time. And I have to say that as a historian of women and gender, I'm always a little bit skeptical about claims that women were either marginal or invisible in the past. And in my experience, these kinds of beliefs usually result from two places, the materials we study as historians and the people that we choose to illuminate in these materials. And if you think about it from a practical perspective, it's just easier to find records about men. Unfortunately, most of the documents that have survived were authored by men, and men appear more frequently in these documents. So I'll give you an example from my own research about how it's so easy to overlook women, but why adding them to this story of Jamaica really matters. When I was in the National Archives of Scotland, I was looking through this large collection of family papers. Almost all of the letters were written by men, which is very typical. And I was there one afternoon. It was getting late. I was almost ready to go home. And I stumbled across a series of letters that were written by one woman named Sarah Shanks and her daughter, Anna Shanks. These letters were just randomly buried in a much bigger collection, and it would have been really easy to overlook them. But when I read the letters, I learned that these women were essentially building a substantial mercantile enterprise in Jamaica. They were importing all sorts of goods from Europe and India to the island, and they were then illegally re-shipping those goods to Spanish colonies. So they're the women I mentioned earlier, who are involved in this contraband trade. And this leads me to the second part of your question, which is what do we gain when we center women and families in our history of Jamaica? So the example I just told you about shows us that women are definitely involved in connecting the island with markets all over the world. And they're operating in Jamaica at a really critical time between 1700 and the 1750s, which is crucial not just for Jamaican history, but for the history of the British Empire. And it's an era that we really neglect in a lot of our work on the 18th century for all sorts of reasons. But this is when Jamaica becomes the primary destination for British slave ships. It's when Jamaica transports the largest population of enslaved Africans in British America to the island. It's also when Jamaica becomes the richest place in the empire. And I wanted to tell a story about this moment that wasn't just about imperial officials or elite planters. I was really interested in ordinary people who settled the island. And when I did my research, I realized that you can't really tell this story if you leave women and families out. So there are a few things about Jamaica's environment that make women so crucial to this colony specifically. Jamaica, if you know anything about it, is a place of extremes in the 18th century. It's a place where you can get very rich and make a lot of money. It's also really dangerous. So we're living in the midst of a pandemic, but what free and enslaved people experience in Jamaica is absolutely catastrophic. People are constantly dying from all sorts of illnesses and diseases. And at the same time, we have this really stark disparity between free and enslaved people. So some parts of the island, free people are outnumbered one to 10 by enslaved people. And I wanted to understand how colonial families are coping with these really severe conditions, but they're also contributing to them. And this is where women enter the picture. So I talked about high mortality rates. Women act sort of like the glue that binds together what is a very precarious, a very fragile world. And families become very reliant on female members to shoulder all sorts of responsibilities that they might not take on in Britain. 
And what also happens is that women's responsibilities look really different in the colony because they're so involved in slavery. And so when we center women and families in our history of Jamaica, it really changes our entire account of how this island develops. A lot of historians have noted that it can be really difficult to find and recover the lives of women in people of color because they haven't always been prominent in our examinations of the past. But we know these people definitely existed. I mean, even today, if you think about it, women make up half the world's population. So could you tell us more about your archival adventures and how you went about retrieving these voices that are often silent and not as prominent in the archives? Sure. This is another great question. It's one that I think about a lot. And it's also one that I talk a lot with my students about because they don't really have a sense of how difficult it is to uncover evidence of the lives of people who were marginalized. And if we're talking about enslaved people who are also commodified in the past. So this is part of the legacy of colonial violence that still shapes the archives. And I'll use my own research, as you mentioned, to offer an example of how I'm able to tell the stories of some of these women. When I went to Britain to begin my research as a naive graduate student, I imagined that I was going to find all of these wonderful collections of letters and diaries that were written by women. And when I began my research, I quickly realized that this material did not exist for 18th century Jamaica. So I had to pivot and readjust my strategy. And what this meant was that I ended up looking at a lot of legal documents that I had had no intention of studying, like wills and probate records and court records and parish registers. And then when I was in Jamaica, I began looking through these really dusty volumes of wills they're literally falling apart. And I noticed that maybe one out of every 10 wills was made by a woman. And I also saw that lots of men were referring to female family members in their own wills. So this is when I decided to record all of the wills made by women during the first 100 years of English settlement on the island. It's a task that I don't necessarily recommend for everybody. It can be very tedious, but this research really became the heart of the project because the wills gave me glimpses of the lives of a very diverse group of women that I just wasn't finding in other sources. So, for instance, when I opened the book, I used the story of this woman, Elizabeth Keyhorn, and I'm constructing her life from what is literally one or two sentences in her will. That's all I have. I know that Elizabeth was moderately wealthy. She lived in Kingston in the 1720s. She owned property there. She also owned two enslaved women, Daphne and Jenny, and their daughters. But when I studied her will more carefully, I noticed that she briefly, briefly references two of her own children, and she describes them as being enslaved. So this one sentence opens up all sorts of fascinating questions about her life, which, of course, we can't definitively answer because we don't have more evidence. But I suspect that she probably spent part of her life enslaved, that somehow she managed to obtain her freedom. And then she goes on to marry. We know this because she calls herself a widow. And she makes enough money to buy property and other people. So this is just one example of how a single sentence really made me rethink a lot of my assumptions about how gender, race, and slavery worked in the Caribbean. And I think it's really important in terms of thinking about how it's possible to extract a lot of information from sources that we don't usually think about looking at, or maybe we don't necessarily want to look at, and then reading them very carefully to uncover and recover, as you said, the lives of people who are otherwise quite obscured in the archives. As you've mentioned several times, Jamaica was an island with a practice of slavery. And Jeremy would like to know how and why slavery began in Jamaica and whether there were any differences between slavery is practiced in Jamaica versus slavery is practiced in the 13 British North American colonies. <laughs> 
Thanks, Jeremy. That's a really important question. The English always envisioned the labor of enslaved Africans as being crucial to Jamaica's development. So I've found evidence as early as 1662 of military governors urging the crown to specifically send enslaved Africans to the colony. And this is one of the key differences between the way that colonial settlement unfolds in Jamaica versus what we might be more familiar with in colonies like Virginia and Barbados. Jamaica never goes through a phase of experimentation with European indentured servitude like some of these older colonies do. And we also know this because from the start, racialized slavery is just embedded in Jamaica's laws. The Jamaica Assembly passes legal codes that draw sharp distinctions between enslaved Africans and servants. So for instance, if you're a servant and you run away, you can be whipped in Jamaica. If you're an enslaved person, you can have your ear cut off or your nose slit. If you're a repeat offender for running away and you're a servant, the time of your indenture is extended. If you're enslaved, you can be executed without a trial by jury for running away. And these laws only work if colonists participate in very brutal behavior. So this is the piece that really interests me because we have to remember that there are no police and there's no standing army on the island. And colonists, as I mentioned before, are very outnumbered by enslaved Africans who continually reject and resist the conditions of servitude. And the only way for colonists to survive is to use brute force and to be very coercive. And what interested me in particular was how women participate in this system. And it's very difficult to uncover this evidence. But I do find one collection of letters that I talk about in the book that were written by a woman plantation owner named Mary Elbridge. And this is one of the few sets of correspondence that I uncovered. And in her letters, Mary Elbridge very clearly identifies enslaved people as property, as disposable and replaceable. She talks about them in ways that we find very disturbing. She describes injured, sick, and elderly people who have basically worked themselves to death for her benefit in a very callous way. Now, she doesn't write explicitly about her own violent actions. But she does make records of payments for sending enslaved people to jail. This is a common punishment for enslaved people and for having other people whip enslaved people. So she's just one of these women who's definitely involved in the project of creating a society that relies intensively on coercion and violence to sustain itself. But I just want to backtrack and go back to Jeremy's question about Jamaica in comparison with the 13 colonies, because I think it's really important that we don't overstate these distinctions between different regions of empire. There's a tendency to do this. And I think instead we need to consider Jamaica as being on one end of a spectrum. We think about the scale of slavery because slavery is just larger on the island it has the most enslaved inhabitants. There are about 100,000 enslaved people living on Jamaica by the middle of the 18th century. And colonists are just a lot richer in Jamaica. But there are very few regions in British America that are untouched by slavery. And bondage was brutal and cruel wherever you lived. The kinds of laws that the Jamaica Assembly passed are commonplace in British America. And Jeremy's question about these differences also brings women into the picture, because when we focus on women, we get a very different portrait of Jamaican slavery. So usually we imagine the Caribbean colonies as just being covered by unending sugar plantations. But when you look at the numbers for Jamaica, only about 50% of the enslaved population works on sugar plantations. And I wanted to know what the other 50% was doing. And looking at women's activities helps to answer this question. 
So for instance, women who are involved in agriculture tend to be ranchers. And this means that the people they command are kind of like the 18th century equivalent of cowboys. And when we look at Jamaica from this perspective, it starts looking a lot more like South Carolina in the early 18th century. And just to make another connection between Jamaica and the 13 colonies, if we look at urban areas and we think about women and slavers and what their captives are doing, enslaved men tend to work as highly skilled artisans. Others are laboring aboard ships as mariners. Captive women typically receive less training, and so they do more unskilled labor that is traditionally feminine, like cooking and cleaning and washing clothes. And from this angle, when we're thinking about urban slavery in Jamaica, it starts to look a lot like urban slavery in Philadelphia or New York. And so I just want to say that in some ways, yes, Jamaica is different, but in other ways, we can see all sorts of connections between the mainland and the Caribbean. Now, I'd like to return to something that Christine said earlier, which is that the English took possession of Jamaica in 1670, and what they took possession of was a really unstable island. Late 17th century Jamaican society had a lot of violence and a lot of turbulence. And if you think about it, that really seems like it must have been a very dangerous situation in which to have a slave society. Christine, after we take a moment to talk about our episode sponsor, I'd really like for you to tell us a bit more about the population that England inherited from the Spanish in 1670. This episode is brought to you by the Omohundro Institute, proud publishers of award-winning books since 1943. As Christine has been telling us, Women were active participants and played important roles in the building of Great Britain's Atlantic Empire. And one of the important roles that women of 17th and 18th century Jamaica played was that they were slaveholders. Christine's book, Jamaica Ladies, is the first systematic study of the free and freed women of European, Euro-African, and African descent who helped to embed the practice of slavery into the British Empire. These women were active participants in helping to transform Jamaica into the wealthiest slaveholding colony in the Anglo-Atlantic world. Plus, they helped to create and maintain the active system of violence that allowed Jamaica's slave society to exist. The Society for the Study of Early Modern Women and Gender awarded Jamaica Ladies its Best Book Award for 2020. Now, if today's episode has piqued your curiosity about the ladies who helped to transform Jamaica into a wealthy colony, who created and maintained Jamaica's slaveholding society, and who helped to build the British Atlantic Empire. Well, today is your lucky day. Because the Omohundro Institute's publishing partner, the University of North Carolina Press, is offering you the chance to purchase Christine Walker's book, Jamaica Ladies, at a 40% discount. Just visit benfranklinsworld.com slash Jamaica and use code 01BFW to receive a 40% discount off the cover price of either the cloth or paperback editions. Visit benfranklinsworld.com slash Jamaica and use code 01BFW to save 40%. I'll place the link in the code in the show notes. Christine, would you tell us more about the Jamaican population that England inherited from the Spanish in 1670, how England added to that population and how they attempted to stabilize this Jamaican society? Sure. So when we answer this question, I need to say at the start that the demographic information we have about the colony in the 17th century is pretty sketchy. There are a few census records from the 18th century, the early 18th century. What we have are written reports made by government officials and travel narratives written by authors, some of whom may have gone to the colony, others who are just taking secondhand information or really imagining the colony from their armchairs in Britain. And what this means is that we get different numbers from different sources. So for instance, one author might write in the 1670s that 1,700 families have settled on the island and that the total population, including free and enslaved people, is about 15,000 inhabitants. Another author who is writing for the Board of Trade or the Crown, 
might assess the colony's population in a much more negative way and give us a lower number. And so what these different accounts show us about reports on demographic information is that they always have political agendas. This is something that I try to get my students to think about. If the author wants to attract more settlers, he is going to inflate the population to convince people that this is an attractive place to move. But the government officials are usually painting really negative pictures of the island because they want the crown to spend more money on bringing settlers and soldiers to Jamaica. To get back to your question about what we do know, I think we can paint some broad brushstrokes in the sense of demographics and say that in the 1670s, there are about 7,000 free people and 7,000 enslaved people on the island. And we don't really know how many of these people were male or female, but I think this number is significant because it tells us that about 15 years after England seizes Jamaica, the major dividing line in the society is already between slavery and freedom. So colonists' commitment to slave labor and their assumption that Africans will perform this labor is unambiguous. To answer the second part of your question about how England asserts control over the population, they definitely pass these really severe laws that I described earlier. But what I find very interesting about the late 17th century and what I think we really need to study more is that the enslaved population increases so quickly between 1670 and the 1690s. So we go from about 7,000 enslaved people to 40,000 captives by 1693. This is an increase of about 30,000 people, and it's really astonishing. And what it shows us is that England is aggressively involved in the slave trade. And this is a moment when, from the imperial side, the Royal African Company, this is the company that Charles II and his brother James, Duke of York, established to give the crown a monopoly on trade with Africa really formalizes its operations. And these numbers show us how effective the Royal African Company is at transporting people across the Atlantic. But I think they also show us how willing ordinary people are to participate in slavery. And I find this one demographic number to be very chilling. Another really interesting demographic that Christine highlights in her book, Jamaica Ladies, is that Jamaica had a really high instance of illegitimate birth. In fact, it had the highest instance of illegitimate birth of anywhere in the British Empire. Christine, could you tell us about why it seems like Jamaica men and women were reluctant to get married and yet also willing to form so many families outside of marriage? I'm so glad you asked this question because it's one of the most interesting findings of my research. It's also one of the most puzzling and difficult questions to answer. So I'll do my best. When I was going through the baptism records in Jamaica, I noticed that lots of parents who baptized their children weren't married, and this seemed really odd to me. When I started crunching the numbers, it became clear that Jamaica had an extraordinarily high illegitimacy rate. So just to give your listeners a sense of what I'm talking about, one quarter to one third of all of the children who are baptized in the island are born out of wedlock. Their parents are not married. Now, answering the part about why they don't marry is trickier because people generally don't leave a lot of records explaining why they make these intimate choices in their lives. As I mentioned, it's difficult enough to find letters written by women and they don't exactly explain why they don't marry. So we need to look at who these mothers are to start answering the question. And they're quite diverse, which is another reason it's so intriguing. Some of the mothers who have their children baptized are enslaved. And when I'm describing Jamaica as this place of incredible brutality, this brutality also includes really endemic sexual and violence towards enslaved women. So in this context, it's quite possible that the children these enslaved women are baptizing are born of 
sexual coercion. And we need to remember that. And women are merely, rarely marrying men if the women are enslaved. And so it makes sense that these children are illegitimate. When we start looking at some of the other mothers, it becomes more puzzling and strange and difficult to answer that question of why don't they get married? So another group of mothers are free women of Euro-African descent. And at first, we might think that men avoid marrying women with African ancestry because they're adhering to a certain racial hierarchy or racial logic on the island. But what is strange and interesting, at least from our perspective, about this time in Jamaican history is that some of the most elite and politically important men on the island openly pursue relationships with women of color and start families with them. And a contingent of these political officials also promote the idea that the solution for boosting Jamaica's free population is to have children with women of African descent to replace all of these settlers who keep dying from disease. So Jamaica isn't necessarily a place where culturally interracial marriage is frowned upon. And to make the story even stranger, Jamaica is also very unusual in the British Empire when we compare it to mainland colonies because the assembly never prohibits interracial sex and marriage. So there's no law, and there's also almost a cultural acceptance of these relationships. So we can see when we're trying to piece together an answer to why the high illegitimacy rates in Jamaica, that a woman's legal status strongly influences her ability to marry. Enslaved women rarely marry free men, but free women of African descent can definitely legally marry. And these marriages, I think, may have been more common on the island than we assume. But I'm going to get to the strangest and most puzzling part of this pattern. And it's the women who appear as white in the parish registers. So I'm talking about, for example, a woman like Elizabeth Sanderson, who has four children with a man named Patrick Montgomery, but the couple never marries. And what makes their relationship intriguing is that they have material resources to support their family. And they clearly have this committed relationship because they have four children together over a period of many years. So why don't they get married? To answer this question, I have to use other sources if they exist and try to learn more about the couples when I can. So for instance, I'm really lucky with Elizabeth Sanderson because she leaves a will and Patrick's estate is probated, so there's an inventory. And what these documents show is that Elizabeth is actually more wealthy than Patrick. She owns land, plantations, land in Kingston, and enslaved people. And she's very careful to identify herself in her will as a single woman. When we put these pieces of evidence together, we can start thinking about the reasons behind their decision not to get married. Now, if you're familiar with early modern marriage, then you know that legally and financially, marriage is a really bad deal for women. It's socially imperative, but in every other respect, marriage is designed to benefit men. And once women marry, their husbands assume the legal rights to all of their property under the law of coverture. So what I think is that for a woman like Elizabeth Sanderson, remaining legally single is strategic. It allows her to maintain control over her property. And this is really urgent in Jamaica because so many of these women are deeply invested in slavery. Basically, they stand a lot more to lose when they get married. And Jamaica is quirky in another sense legally because The assembly never passes laws to regulate female sexuality. So there are no laws against bastard bearing like there are in Britain and in some of the other colonies. And it's not a crime to have illegitimate children. And what I think is that this really gives women and families a way to maneuver and to develop strategies that allow them to protect their resources in these really innovative and unprecedented ways in the British Empire.
it's really fascinating to think about how looking at illegitimate birth rates really allows us to see this wide spectrum of women who remain single, presumably in an effort to maintain control of their property. And speaking of property, it does seem like Jamaica had a lot of female slaveholders. And we can learn in Jamaica Ladies from Christine's book there that there were some women who controlled hundreds of enslaved workers and others who had been formerly enslaved themselves who were able to build up enough wealth to buy their own enslaved people. Christine, would you tell us about the spectrum of slave ownership, which you mentioned earlier, and about the women from Jamaica who were on the spectrum? The spectrum of women and slavers is very wide, as you mentioned. So if you remember, I talked about Elizabeth Keyhorn earlier. She's the woman who lived in Kingston and owned property, including enslaved people, but who also had children who were still enslaved. And I bring her up again because she's, on one hand, very contradictory, and on the other hand, very ordinary. She really resembles the majority of the women who I study. She's a widow, which means that she's been married, but she now has legal control of her property. She isn't wealthy, but she owns land. So she's definitely well off by British and mainland American standards. And her location in Kingston is also very typical of female colonists. The majority of Jamaica's women who are freed, female colonists, congregate in places like Kingston and Port Royal and Spanish Town. And this is because there are more economic opportunities for them than there are in more remote areas. And it's also safer for them. So women who live in these urban areas work in all sorts of jobs. They import goods, they are shopkeepers, they're seamstresses, they're milliners, they cook, they clean. And it's also possible that Elizabeth Keyhorn, like many other women that I study, bought property so that she could rent it out or run it as a lodging house to earn income. Now, Elizabeth Keyhorn, as I mentioned, is also a slaveholder. She owns four people. And this also makes her typical in Jamaica. Most of the women I study are small scale slave owners. I estimate that the average woman commands about eight people and holds eight people in her possession. But Elizabeth also has family connections with people who are still in bondage. And in one sense, this strikes us as being very unusual. But as the story unfolds in my book, she is certainly not the only woman who both participates in slavery and maintains very close connections with enslaved people. And again, this seems so contradictory. And part of what I'm doing in the book is trying to unravel this contradiction. And it's one of the reasons that makes studying women and slavers so important, because they typically own fewer people. Their relationships involve much higher degrees of interpersonal contact. And one of the things that I'm continually trying to imagine in my work is the nature of these very fraught relationships between women and slavers and the people they're holding in bondage. I try to think about what it was like to live and work together in small spaces. And one of the ways I think about this is by looking at manumission records. So for instance, I talk about this woman named Mary Cousins, who is a widowed sugar planter, And she creates connections with free and enslaved people of African descent. And when she makes her will in 1745, Mary gives a free woman of color named Elizabeth Dunning money to purchase Elizabeth's husband, who is still enslaved. So this makes me wonder about Mary's ties to Elizabeth. Were they just close friends? Were they related? How did she know this couple? This evidence also shows us that free women were marrying enslaved women. So it brings these couples into our field of vision. And her will becomes even more complicated because Mary also frees an enslaved man who works as her coach driver and also a child of Euro-African ancestry. So this leads me to think about her relationship with this man and this child. And I wonder if it's even possible that this is her own child. 
Now, we need to remember that I'm working with threads of evidence here, usually just single lines and wills and inventories. But once you start tugging at these threads, all sorts of unexpected and intriguing relationships come into view. And this is what makes studying women and slavers so fascinating. So when you go through all the materials, it becomes clear that Elizabeth Keyhorn and Mary Cousins are not very unusual in Jamaica. And this really challenges us to reconceptualize slavery in a way, right? It leads me to think about how enslavement works as a practice rather than as a legal code or a totalizing system. And it's a practice that women have to carefully negotiate because some of them are very dependent on the people who they're holding in bondage to earn an income. As we know from many of our conversations on this podcast, slave ownership tended to bring wealth, economic power, and political power. And Stessa wonders what kind of economic and political power Jamaica's female slaveholders had in Jamaican society and how that power may have changed over time. Thanks, Tessa. That's another really, all of these are important questions, but that's another really important question. So thinking of again about evidence and what we have, I used probated inventories, which are basically lists of people's material possessions when they died to create a rough portrait of women's economic power. So I estimate that the average female colonist was worth anywhere from 200 to 800 pounds sterling. And this would be very conservatively between 43,000 to 100,000 pounds today. And this figure becomes really striking when you compare it to the average wealth of someone living in Britain or mainland America, which is 40 pounds. And it's even more extreme when we consider the fact that servants only earn between 5 and 15 pounds in the 18th century. What this tells us is that women in Jamaica are generally much wealthier than women and men living elsewhere in the empire. And I try to connect their wealth to their investment in slavery because this is one of the things I'm very interested in in the book. I look at their probated inventories and their wills And I estimate that anywhere from about 50% to 80% of an average woman's wealth is comprised of enslaved people. And this economic power increases over time as the colony's reliance on slavery deepens. And does economic power matter in Jamaica? Absolutely. Jamaica doesn't have a hereditary aristocracy like Britain. So people have to find all kinds of new ways for signaling their status. And material wealth is a primary way to do this. This is a kind of society that creates room for women to achieve a higher status by commanding larger fortunes. So just to summarize, women are using the wealth that they derive largely from their investment in slavery to advance themselves and their families in colonial society. And then Tessa also asked about political power. And this is where we see the real gendered barriers coming down. Women slaveholders still operate in a man's world, and there are very clear limitations on what they can do. Women, for the most part, are excluded from formal politics. They don't serve on the assembly. They don't sit on juries. I do find a few intriguing exceptions to this rule. For instance, a woman who works as a bailiff on the island, but this is very unusual. To answer your question about whether women manage plantations remotely, yes, they're definitely working and earning incomes as absentee managers from Britain. And there's a scholar named Hannah Young in the UK who's doing some really interesting work about these women. And a few of the women I study do also relocate to London. But on the whole, most of them stay in the colony. And this is either because they can't afford to move to Britain or they don't want to. You know, we have this assumption that every person in the Caribbean is desperately aspiring to relocate to Britain. But I don't think this is quite 
accurate, especially in the first half of the 18th century. Most of the women I study are born on the island. I'm looking at second and third generation colonists. And they consider Jamaica, not Britain, to be their home. And I think they're savvy enough to realize that they command a lot more authority and autonomy in Jamaica than they might in Britain. And they prefer to stay there. Our conversation today has largely focused on the British Atlantic world outside of mainland North America. Christine, why do you think it's important for us to occasionally shift our gaze from mainland North America to the wider British Atlantic world? And what do you think that looking at the histories of places like Jamaica can reveal to us about the history and experiences of those who lived in mainland North America? I think it's really critical for us to move beyond North America in our work for several reasons. So you hosted Vincent Brown on your show recently, and he reminded us that Jamaica is one of 26 British colonies at the time of the American Revolution. And the work done by Vincent Brown and Trevor Bernard in particular really sparked my interest in thinking about Jamaica's centrality and the British Empire. And this perspective also makes sense if we adopt the orientation of the people we're studying. So in the 18th century, colonists living throughout the empire think of themselves as British subjects. And if you're young and ambitious, usually a man, not so much a woman, and you don't stand to inherit money, then the number one place that you'd want to go to make your fortune is the Caribbean, and it's probably Jamaica. This is the real financial frontier of the Atlantic world. And it's important to remember also that there are very strong economic and social connections between North America and the Caribbean. And so what I hope is that this book is contributing to scholarship that encourages us to have a more holistic and a more comprehensive view of the British Empire. Let's move into the time warp. This is a fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. opinion, what might have happened if the 13 British North American colonies had followed Jamaica's lead in accepting and adopting a more fluid perception of race and gender? How might the development of slavery in the mainland North American colonies have been different? So I'm going to answer this question with a would it have been so different? Jamaica's colonists develop a particular kind of society because they have direct access to hundreds of slave ships that are arriving from Africa to Jamaica's shores every year. But I think if colonists in mainland America were able to purchase captive Africans in the same way that people in Jamaica did, then they would have developed a very similar kind of society. One thing this project has taught me and that I've thought a lot about is human nature And what we see in Jamaica is that people from all walks of life, including women, are incredibly driven to survive and to increase their family wealth. And they're really willing to engage in what, from our perspective, is profoundly exploitative and coercive behavior to accomplish these goals. And I don't think people living in mainland America would have behaved any differently from colonists in Jamaica if they had the same opportunities. And this takes us back to women slaveholders, you know, I was conceived of this book as the beginning rather than the end of a much larger investigation of women's involvement in Atlantic slavery in the 18th century and a meditation on some of the consequences of women's actions. We simply don't know how many women living in Maryland or South Carolina during the colonial period, for instance, owned slaves. We really need to dig in to those wills and those probate records so that we can start making these kinds of comparisons between Jamaica and the other colonies. And my hunch is that women throughout British America 
were prospering from slavery in all sorts of direct and indirect ways. And I'm really excited to see what other scholars are going to find if they decide to pursue this subject. Is there an aspect of history that you're researching and writing about now? I have a few different things on the stove. One is an article about a court case that I didn't get to write about in detail in the book. It's a court case I found in Jamaica that is very unusual. It involves a mother who is accused of terribly abusing her daughter. And it's unusual because we usually think of men as the agents of violence in their families or in relation to enslaved people. And I'm using this article to think more deeply about female violence. I'm also starting to work on my second project. So as you mentioned, I'm based in Singapore. And this has led me to expand my vision and my interests beyond the Atlantic world and to think about the British Empire more holistically. And I've become very interested in the economic and the cultural connections between the Caribbean and the Indian Ocean. And I'm really interested in thinking about how women and enslaved people are making these connections between these two parts of the world. And the way that I'm going to do this in my second project is by focusing on the textile trade and studying how people are using textiles that are produced in Asia, in the Caribbean, both for economic reasons and to reshape their own identities. Where's the best place to find more information about you and how we can get in contact with you if we have more questions about female slaveholders in Jamaica? The best place to find out more about my work and to contact me is my faculty page on the Yale and U.S. College website, and my email address is listed on that page. Christine Walker, thank you for joining us from Singapore and for helping us to build a better understanding of the history of slavery and of female slaveholding in Jamaica. Thank you. It was a pleasure. If we want to understand the world of early America, then sometimes we need to look beyond North America's shores. The British Atlantic Empire that the North American colonies stood a part of really comprised Great Britain and 26 Atlantic colonies. Now, looking beyond North America and looking at the British Atlantic world as a whole allows us to see how Jamaica, not New York, Pennsylvania, or South Carolina, was really the jewel of Great Britain's imperial holdings. By the mid to late 18th century, Jamaica was Great Britain's wealthiest colony and the colony with the largest population of enslaved people. As Christine revealed, the history of Jamaica is really a microcosm of the history of European colonialism. Through the history of Jamaica, we can see how European colonization devastated and displaced Native nations like the Arawak. We can see how the rise of slavery brought great violence to early American societies and great wealth. We can also see how women, were central and active players in the process of empire building. Christine's study in Jamaica Ladies finds that the women of Jamaica actively participated in the violence and practice of slavery. Whereas a servant in England or North America might earn between 5 and 15 pounds sterling a year for their labor, the average female colonist in Jamaica had a wealth of between 200 and 800 pounds sterling. This means that women in Jamaica tended to be wealthier than women elsewhere with the average Jamaican woman owning about eight enslaved people and having invested 50 to 80% of their wealth into slavery. And because female slaveholders in Jamaica tended to live and work in areas where they had to work closely with their enslaved people or in places where they were extremely dependent upon their enslaved people to make their wealth, women slaveholders tended to interact with their enslaved people closely, which helps us to see different aspects of the British institution and practice of slavery. It also helps us to see the many ways that women in Jamaica exercised the power that they had. Many women chose not to marry or remarry so that they would be in charge of their human and material property. Exploring the histories of slavery and the larger British Atlantic world can really help us better understand the shape of the British Atlantic world and see how many of the ideas and institutions that came to take hold in Great Britain's 13 North American colonies, how those institutions developed and evolved. For more information about Christine, her book, Jamaica Ladies, plus notes and links for everything we talked about today, check out the show notes page, benfranklinsworld.com slash 2 
1-800-273-8893. If our conversation with Christine piqued your curiosity about the ladies who helped to build Jamaica and the larger British Atlantic Empire, be sure to visit benfranklinsworld.com slash Jamaica and use code 01BFW to save 40% off Christine's book, Jamaica Ladies. To save 40% off the cover price of Christine Walker's book, Jamaica Ladies, visit benfranklinsworld.com slash Jamaica and use code 01BFW. Production assistance for this podcast comes from the Omohundro Institute's digital audio team. Joseph Edelman, Martha Howard, Holly White, Karen Wolf, and Peyton Young. Breakmaster Cylinder composed our custom theme music. Finally, are there other places in the broader Atlantic world that you're interested in learning more about? Let me know. Liz at benfranklinsworld.com. Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omahundro Institute.